Hi everyone, in this video from Count Backwards from 10, we're going to take a look at Acute Respiratory Distress Syndrome, or ARDS as it's commonly referred to as. Specifically, we're going to take a look at the pathophysiology, causes, criteria to diagnose, and management goals. Before we get started, if you like my videos, hit the like button below and subscribe. So, ARDS is the result of diffuse alveolar damage within the lungs. This results in widespread inflammation of the lung along with infiltration of that tissue with neutrophils and lymphocytes, and most importantly, fluid accumulation. It's this fluid accumulation that causes the chest x-ray imaging commonly seen that we're going to discuss shortly. So let's define ARDS using uh, clinical criteria. So for this, we use something that we'd call the Berlin criteria. Now, the first thing is that it is a form of respiratory failure with fluid in the lungs that is not attributed to cardiogenic shock or cardiogenic origin. What this means is that the patient does not have fluid in their lungs because their heart isn't pumping well and therefore is backing up into their lungs. Secondly, and I alluded to this earlier, this will come along with chest imaging that reveals bilateral patchy infiltrates. Bilat patchy infiltrates. What this means is that you're going to have bilateral haziness, fogginess everywhere on both sides of the lung. Now, the third thing is that ARDS results in hypoxemia with a P to F ratio. And what that means is your PaO2, your arterial O2, to your inspired or fractional inspired oxygen of less than 300. And this is with a PEEP greater than 5 or equal to 5, I'm sorry at least. Now, this is then further stratified into mild, moderate, and severe, where moderate is 200 to 300. I apologize. Mild is 200 to 300. Moderate is 100 to 200. And severe is less than 100. So what this means in layman's terms, the amount of oxygen in the blood compared to the amount of oxygen we are giving the patient is low. And that's because the condition makes it so you cannot adequately exchange oxygen from these damaged fluid filled, neutrophil filled alveoli into the blood. Think of it like this. Normally we breathe 21% oxygen because that's the air and a normal PA O2 is about 80 to 100. That would make our ratio 100 to 0.21 or 21%, which is about 475. So that would be a normal P to F ratio. So imagine now you're being cranked up to 70, 80, 90% oxygen. So instead of 0.21, it's 0 0.7, 0 0.8, and you're still only getting a PaO2 of 100. It's a much, much lower ratio. I hope that makes sense. So let's touch on the causes. I wish this list was shorter, but the reality of it is that many, many different things can cause ARDS. Everything from pneumonia to aspiration, lung contusions, really any insult to the lung can result in ARDS, but so can general sepsis, abdominal infections, pancreatitis, and many other things. So this can be a sequelae of really anything that occurs uh, pathologically to a person, not anything obviously, but you know, major, major um, bodily sur uh, insults that cause a surge response in the body. Because of this, uh, you know, because it can be caused by such a wide spectrum of pathologies, when we're talking about our ICU patients, we always have to be cognizant 
of this as a reason that a patient may start to desaturate um, or something like this may occur with changes on our chest x-rays. So ARDS can be made worse by a number of mechanisms, especially those related to positive pressure ventilation. For starters, high tidal volume, we'll just abbreviate that as high VT, and high peak and plateau pressures can really make it worse. This is because of volume and barotrauma to the lung. This is because every time the alveoli open and collapse and reopen and collapse, there are shearing stresses that can further damage that tissue. So we'll just write down shearing stress from opening and reopening. And then when we put these patients on high FiO2, as we know, our bodies are really only used to 21%. Long-term on 100% oxygen or very high concentration of oxygen can result in oxygen toxicity, which in turn results in free radical formation of oxygen, which goes ahead and damages tissue. Now, some number of patients who develop ARDS go on to develop fibrosis of the lungs, which further results in a restrictive lung disease due to healing with non-compliant fibrous tissue. So what happens? Our patients become hypoxic because of the inability to diffuse oxygen from the edematous inflamed alveolar membrane into the blood. Furthermore, because these patients are on positive pressure ventilation as opposed to breathing spontaneously, we decrease the venous return and thus pulmonary blood flow, which can further worsen our VQ matching because we increase our dead space. This in turn can result in worsening of the patient's metabolic status due to increased retention of CO2, acidosis, etc. This is referred to as a permissible hypercapnia. So what can we do about it? I know many of you have read about this. It may be new to others, but we're going to go ahead and go through it. So first, fluid management. There's a push for conservative fluid management as patients with less total volume have been found to have decreased days of mechanical ventilation and decreased ICU days, but not changes in morbidity mortality. Next, we need to treat our underlying cause, meaning if there's an infection. Oh, I'm sorry, I didn't write this. Decrease fluid status. And we want to treat cause, which could be our infection or whatever it is. After this, it's really going to be general support. And what this means is nutrition, supporting other organs that may be affected, such as hemodialysis and kidney failure patients, etc. Then we need vent management. And this is probably the most important thing, and I'm sure many of you have read about the ARDSNETS trial. We want low tidal volumes, 6 ml per kg tidal volumes. And we don't want our plateau pressure to be greater than 30. We don't want this. Think of it like this. It's harder to blow up a balloon that's completely empty or one that already has some air in it without getting too heavy into the equations of surface tensions, tension and all these things. Uh, we don't want our alveoli to completely collapse because they're much harder to reopen or recruit. Along with this, we can perform recruitment maneuvers recruitment maneuvers in order to help open up more alveoli to uh, work with uh, improving our VQ matching. There's also some other modes of ventilation, but we're going to talk about that in a different video. Now, I do want to make note of it again over here, permissive hypercapnia. And this is a function of our low tidal volume. Remember that minute ventilation is equal to tidal volume times respiratory rate. And if we decrease our tidal volume, then our minute ventilation drops. And if our minute ventilation drops, the amount of CO2 we put out drops. As a result, stays in the blood. This in turn will result in an increase in CO2 retention and a resultant acidemia and acidosis. We usually let this ride to a pH of less than 7.2, but once we're below that, we need to start treating it with sodium bicarbonate. Now, the last part I want to discuss is adjunct therapies as special considerations. Um, they may help, they might not. Neuromuscular blockade, so we'll just put it as neuromuscular blockade. I apologize, I know this video is going to be an extra minute. 
can be used in order to help make the patient more synchronous with the vent, meaning that they won't buck or fight against it and instead help their lungs rest and just be ventilated for them. Uh, we do need to be careful though because patients who are in the ICU already have a, uh, an increased risk of ICU neuropathy and paralyzing them can make that worse. Next, we can use nitrous oxide or NO. An inhaled nitrous oxide has a very short half-life, but when delivered directly into the bronchioles helps to dilate the pulmonary vasculature, improving blood flow and improving oxygenation, even if it's only transient. And then finally, ECMO or extracorporeal membranous oxygenation. In English, this is basically oxygenating outside the body. This rests the lungs as the person is no longer dependent on their lungs to oxygenate. Unfortunately, this is only done in very specific patients and in very specialized centers. So I hope this is a good introduction and overview of ARDS for you. As always, if you have any questions or concerns, please feel free to write out. And I apologize for the extra minute today.